Mary Mac Bakehouse has started a newsletter. To subscribe, just go to merrimacpodcast.com and enter your email address. You will receive one newsletter a week about news from Standing Chimney, Mary Mac Bakehouse, and every other week, an exclusive recipe from this podcast. That's merrimacpodcast.com. Hello and welcome to In the Kitchen with Mary Mac. Today we have a very special cake recipe for you, and I think you're going to love it. We're going to do a little bit of history of where the recipe came from, but I decided to do the cake recipe itself first, so that if you don't want to listen to this whole long podcast just to get to the cake recipe, you'll have the recipe, because this is a good one. So I was looking for some new cake recipes to try online, and this blog popped up about a certain kind of a cake. I'm reading it. I'm like, ah, I don't know if that sounds right. So I start digging and digging and digging. Finally, I got to the bottom of this giant cake mine, I guess I would call it. <laughs> and I found the name of the recipe, the original recipe, a little bit of information about it. So this is called a Denver chocolate pudding. And it comes from the Fanny Farmer Cookbook 11th edition from 1965. And apparently in the 60s and 70s, this recipe was like the recipe. If you were having people over, you're having a party for special occasions, this was a really popular cake that people made. And I think a lot of cakes of this style were called puddings, where they were basically the format of the recipe determines if it's going to be called a pudding. And I've seen very old recipes that are similar to this that are called puddings, where you make a batter up and then you pour water over the top or boiling water or other liquids over the top and then bake it. And those are all called puddings. I have never seen one quite like this before. I've actually made those type of puddings before. And they are not like this one is when it's done. So this is really, this is magical. <laughs> it's, it's really cool. It's um, sort of like a deconstructed chocolate lava cake. Yes, it's like um, it's like a brownie floating in a lake of chocolate lava. That's what. <laughs> that's what I would have to say. I would have to say, but it is. Oh, this thing is so good, and it's so simple. I think that's probably why it was really popular because it's it seems like the recipes like recipes from that era tend to be either super simple or super complicated. There's no middle ground. It's either some crazy looking compilation of jello, olives and lunch meats or, you know, like the wacky cake that we did a while back. So this is one of those type of things. It's a nice simple recipe, easy to make and like I said I think that's one of the things, if you know anything about the Fanny Farmer cookbook, that's probably a good description of recipes that you typically find in there. They're reasonably simple. They have ingredients that you most likely have on hand. And they're just good, just good recipes. So Denver chocolate pudding. This is what you're going to need for the base part of it. You need three-fourths cup white sugar, one cup of flour, two teaspoons of baking powder, one-eighth teaspoon of salt, two tablespoons of butter, one ounce of unsweetened chocolate, or three tablespoons of cocoa, which is what I use, the three tablespoons of cocoa, a half cup of milk, and a half teaspoon of vanilla. For the topping, you need a half cup of brown sugar, a half cup of white sugar, and four tablespoons of cocoa, and one and a half cups of cold water or brewed coffee that is cold, okay? That's a little twist on this. So, in order to make this cake, you need a nine-inch square pan, and you're going to grease your nine-inch square pan. Would you recommend metal or glass? It doesn't matter. It can be metal or glass. As long as it's nine-inch square is good. You want a deeper one. I know some of them are shallow. You want one that's like two inches deep. So nine inch square pan, two inches deep. Grease that. Then you're going to mix your cake ingredients up first. So you're going to melt your butter and then mix your 
cocoa with the melted butter. Stir it up. It looks just like melted chocolate. If you're going to use unsweetened chocolate, melt your unsweetened chocolate and butter together in a bowl over hot water and just melt that until it's melted. Okay. Doesn't that sound good? Melt it until it's melted. It's very specific. All right. Now you're going to take your uh, three-fourths cup sugar, one cup of flour, two teaspoons of baking powder, eighth teaspoon of salt, and mix those together. Add your half cup of milk and a half teaspoon of vanilla and stir to mix well. And then add your butter and chocolate combination into that and stir it up. And you want to mix that very, very well. Okay? Now, carefully put that, plop that, drop that. It's kind of dense, almost like a brownie batter. And it's also a little bit gritty from the sugar. But don't worry about that. So put that into your nine inch pan and spread it out evenly, as evenly as you can get it, okay? Now for the topping, you mix a half cup of brown sugar, half cup of white sugar, four tablespoons of cocoa together, mix it really well and sprinkle that, or well, I don't know, it's more like pour. Pour that over the top of your cake batter in your nine inch square pan and try to pour it evenly. It's gonna look like um, sandy dirt on top of your cake. Once you get that all poured in relatively evenly, don't try to shake it and make it be more even because you got your batter under there. Pour your one and a half cups of cold water over the top. Then you're going to very carefully put this into the oven. The oven is at 350 degrees. I should have told you to preheat this before you start it, but preheat this before you start it. Would you recommend, so they don't spill water everywhere, pulling out the oven rack once you put like that sand stuff on and then pour the water on? No, because the oven rack is jerky. You have to just real carefully slide it in there. I tried that and the oven rack like makes it slosh, you know. Okay. So just real carefully put the cake in and you're going to bake that for about 40 minutes. At about 30 minutes, your cake will look like an island of cake floating in a bubbling mass of chocolate lava. I mean, it's, it's, you know, that's how it does. So I after feel like we need to film this, like, and do one of those time lapse <laughs> videos. We could. Just to show the progression. We could do that. I think we could do that. So, how do you serve this thing? Well, the classic way of serving this cake is you take it out of the oven hot. And I mean, it's going to be hot. Okay. You take it out of the oven hot. You don't want, you, okay, you can eat this cold. It can, you know, it can cool. My husband ate two-thirds of this cake cold. Didn't, didn't mind at all. He just ate it. But you take it out of the oven, let it cool for a little bit. I would say about 15 to 20 minutes. And then you carefully, and this cake is very sweet. It's not very rich, as you can tell by the ingredients, but it's very sweet. So about a ninth, one ninth of this cake is about right for a serving. So you can serve this. One of the recommended ways to serve it hot is to put it in a bowl with its uh, chocolate syrup that comes with it. As you scoop it up, you'll scoop out some more chocolate syrup out of the pan. And then you can top it with half and half and eat it like that because... Listen, it's 1965. People did this in 1965. However, I would not do that thing. We had it with delicious vanilla ice cream. And I'm telling you, this thing tastes like a hot fudge brownie sundae. That's the best way I could describe this cake. It is so good. It's, it's so good. It's just so good. And it's so easy to make. So um, I'm sure you're going to try this recipe. I'm sure. Because it's, it's that. I can't believe. I've never. I had never heard of this cake before. I had never heard of this I've before. I've never seen anything like it before. No. And the amount of research that I did on this cake is outlandish. This has been like a week and a half of digging to get to the bottom of this recipe. And this is the only, the only place I have found. Like usually if you find an older recipe and you start looking it up, you'll find newspaper archives and a lot of people have it on their recipe blogs and that kind of thing. That is not true with this recipe. You do not find it in a lot of places. So I'm sure 
when people listen to this, they'll say, oh, my grandmother used to make that. This was a cake our family had all the time or something, because it's that kind of a cake. I think that's, that's what people are going to find. So another thing I'd like to mention with this is, and we do this a lot on the podcast about converting things into a vegan recipe. Already, this cake has no eggs in it. So this is a great cake, obviously, for people that have egg allergies or are avoiding eggs. And you're using cocoa powder instead of chocolate. Right. So that doesn't have any dairy in it. Right. You know, from the get-go, it's really just the milk, right? Right. So if you if you use, what I would use in this is I would substitute oat milk for the dairy milk. Almond milk, I don't know... When you get something that's boiling as hard as this is in the oven, I don't like almond milk in it because it kind of breaks down. But I would use oat milk in substitution for the milk and then use your uh, normal vegan spread or dairy-free spread. And there you go. Now you have a delicious vegan cake. And that's that easy. It's that easy. Now, I don't think you could make this sugar-free due to the incredibly high volume of sugar it in it. It is mostly <laughs> sugar. <laughs> yes. it's This cake... This cake has... Um, this is not a cake for people on a diet. This cake, the, the entire cake has uh, one and three-fourths cup of sugar in it. But when you consider that you're also making hot fudge syrup yeah. and cake at the same time, you know, kind of, you can kind of justify, you can justify. I actually saw a couple of <laughs> blogs where they, people tried to make this healthier and I was just howling. Like, that just no. makes it sadder. No, you're not going to. Yes, no, it's going to. Yes. You, if you're going to make a cake like this, you go all out. <laughs> Add more stuff. Well, one to of it. them, one of them didn't cut the sugar at all, but they used skim milk and oh. margarine. And I was laughing. I'm like, seriously? I feel like. What's that the point? Wouldn't... What's the point? That would just add like a weird aftertaste. It wouldn't change yeah, but anything. You got well, you got a, a cup and three fourths of sugar. What's the point of cutting the fat? I mean, and plus you're gonna have this with a big honk and scoop of ice cream. Who cares? At this point, who cares? Just walk eight extra miles or something. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you have to just the entire time that it's baking, just walk around the house, do some laps. Yeah, how many jumping jacks in front of the oven? How many progy points is that of your <laughs> Oh, that's something we were talking about earlier. It'll probably come up later at some point later. But <laughs> so there's your cake recipe. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about, as I researched this, I found out that the original recipe came from the Fanny Farmer cookbook, the 11th edition of the Fanny Farmer cookbook, which was published in 1965. And the reason I was, I was digging, because I wanted to find out how old this recipe was, because I, I thought it couldn't be like super old because most of the time when you find a cake recipe from like, I don't know, like the early 1900s, 1940s, not, they don't use that much sugar. It's not, it's not like that. It's very conservative as far as using sugar because sugar was so expensive. This seems like a super, well, it's, it's easy to make, but the amount of sugar makes it seem like a very, like 1800s well-to-do dinner party yeah, sort maybe, of a dessert. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe something like that. But it's like also that. not complicated, so it yeah. doesn't make sense because presentation-wise, it's not right. like... It's not it's fancy. It's not elaborate. Right. It it's just has a lot of sugar in it. Right. So I first thing I found out, it was from the Fanny Farmer cookbook. So I have a copy of the original Fanny Farmer cookbook, which was actually the Boston Cooking School cookbook that Fanny Farmer published in 1896. So I start looking through this book, and it's not in there. And I'm like, what? It's not in there. So then I found out there's a lot of editions of the Fanny Farmer cookbook. And basically, Fanny Farmer owned the copyright on this cookbook. So basically, her family, every few years, would update it modernize it a little bit, add a few recipes, whatever, just to keep the cookbook alive, okay? So when you get to the 11th edition, apparently this cookbook was actually updated by, it would be, I believe, Fanny Farmer's granddaughter-in-law. So not a direct blood descendant, but who cares, you know. Um, there was a lot of issues with that because when this person modernized it, she I know she did a fine job of modernizing, but some cookbook critic really, really criticized the uh, cookbook. And there was a little bit of this and that back and forth between the publishers and the critic. It went back and forth. So this, the original cookbook, and I believe all the way through the history of the cookbook, the publisher 
was Little and Brown and Company. So when the original cookbook was published, that's who, was, who the publisher was. And it seemed to go right along through the history. Now, who's Fanny Farmer? Well, Fanny Farmer is a person who lived in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. She was born in 1857 in Massachusetts. Her family moved to Medford, Massachusetts uh, when she was a child. And parents had four children. I'm not going to give you the complete history because you can actually look this up. She was the oldest of four children. And the parents at the time, and this is in the late 1800s, they wanted all their girls to go to, to have higher education. They really wanted to make that happen. So Fanny was preparing to graduate from high school. And depending upon which histories you read, either suffered a stroke at age 16 or suffered a bout of polio. And because of that, she was bedridden for a while, took her a long time to recover, so her plans were kind of sidetracked. So in, as a part of her recovery, when she was able to get out of bed and stand, walk around and such, her parents found her a job with a family, sort of being like a mother's helper or... Um, kind of like a nanny sort of Not a thing? nanny, more like a uh, cook, mm -hmm. you know, working in the kitchen, helping the lady of the house oh. get dinner ready oh, and that okay. sort of thing. So the family she worked for found out she was actually a very good cook and told her parents that, you know, she's, this girl's a very good cook. So her parents found this school, the Boston Cooking School, and signed Fanny up, and Fanny went to school there. She did so well at the school that upon graduation, she got a job. And one of the things as part of her job was to put together this cookbook. So what she did, which... I didn't know this much about this person, and I even owned the cookbook. But Fanny Farmer was a very, very smart person and just excelled at whatever she did. And she took a scientific approach to cooking. So Fanny Farmer kind of reminds me of, in our time, J. Kenji Lopez-Alt, who is a chef. He has a series on YouTube where he does scientific cooking you know, and he explains to you the science of what he's doing. It's really interesting. So that's, that was her take on it. So she was, she was very, for the time, remember, this cookbook was published in 1896, okay? So she explains, if you get your hands on a copy of the original Fanny Farmer cookbook, which is still in print, which is my copy looks kind of like a Bible because I got it from some yeah. schmancy book club. Yeah. It's quite oh, fancy. It has, it's even got that gold stuff yes, on the edge of the pages. It has the gold leaf. It has the ribbon bookmark. You can really tell that you haven't cooked over this cookbook no. much because the edges aren't stained at all. No, I've read like, it. They're not wrinkly. I've read it a lot, but not, not cooked out of it. Or let me put it this way. I did cook out of it, but I did not do like I normally do with a cookbook and leave it lay there under what I'm doing, which is why yes. all my cookbooks look... Yes, my, my cookbook that I use the most um, is very clearly the cookbook I use the most. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so anyway, the thing that Fanny did was she standardized recipes, okay? Before Fanny did this, cookbooks were basically, they were called cookery books. Cookery was the, the art of cooking is called cookery, okay? So what these books did was they gave you a recipe which basically used handfuls, scoops, pinches, various measurements like that. So she did like a standardized system of measurements. Right. Right. So what she did was she took recipes and using measurements and science and her own experience, she took recipes and standardized them. So let's say, just for example, if you were making... A cake, okay? So somebody might have their cake recipe and say two handfuls of flour, one handful of sugar, two scoops of butter, a pinch of salt, you know, bake until brown, that sort of thing. So depending upon the size of your hands, <laughs> your cake is going to be very different from the person who made this cake. So basically, by her standardizing recipes, that meant that everybody who made that cake, as long as they followed directions, which as we know that I'm not that good at, but as long as you followed the directions, your cake would come out 
as good as anybody else who made that cake, as opposed to those poor people who had a, had, okay, I had a terrible pie experience, which I believe I've spoken to before on this, that somebody told me um, I needed six tablespoons of flour and then told me, oh, you probably used a regular tablespoon. I mean the kind that you use at the dinner table. Okay, totally not a tablespoon, right? So there's a lot more flour than I used. She took the guesswork out of cooking. So people who were really not good cooks were able to be a pretty good cook. Another thing she did was she developed the idea of cooking for people who were not well, people who were sick, invalids, infirm people. She created a cookbook for them, and she created a system of cooking to help people be healthier. So if you were someone who, who was suffering from an illness or someone who had a chronic disease or something like that, this was designed to help you to eat healthier, to help you to get better. So she did that, which nobody thought about that. Nobody thought about cooking for convalescence, you know, or, or um, which foods were the best foods for someone to eat who needed more energy, or which foods were the best foods to eat for someone who needed less sugar. People didn't think of that in the 1800s. This cake recipe is not for people who need less sugar. Okay, this is for people who needed a lot more sugar. The, the cookbook in general, but um, that's really neat because it's also very simple recipes so like for example because it's the late 1800s early 1900s if you had polio you may not have full use of like your hands so you can't necessarily do like super complicated pie techniques but right you can do stuff that's in this cookbook because it's like not quite as intensive as a lot right. of recipes. Right. And this cookbook, it's very basic. One of the things that I noticed about it, it's it's a New England cookbook. So a lot of the recipes that you'll find in here are New England sorts of things. There's a lot of seafood in here. How to clean seafood, how to care for it in the late 1800s, things like that. So there's a lot of that sort of thing in here. And the really interesting thing, when she, she put this cookbook together, she was actually, at the time, she was, she, when she graduated from the cooking school, she had been hired, and she was like the assistant director and ended up becoming the director. So she, you know, that's a pretty prestigious position. So she develops this cookbook, goes to Little and Brown and Company and wants to publish it. And they said, oh, yeah, we'll publish it, but we don't know how it's going to sell. So the only way that we'll print this is if you pay for the first 3,000 copies to be printed. That sounds crazy, right? That's a however, lot of copies to pay for yourself. However, because she did that, she owned the copyright to the cookbook. Which a lot of people probably didn't own the copyright to their own books right. at that time because they, like the publisher, would just have it. Right. So when she, so she went ahead and paid for that and had it published and it became a bestseller. During her lifetime, she died in 1915. So over the course of just about a little less than 20 years, that cookbook sold 360,000 copies. Now, if you think about it, in that time period, it probably sold 360,000 copies on the East Coast because where else was this? You know, you weren't selling this. Yeah, it wouldn't have been nationwide right. or worldwide. Right. And really, as a nation, where's it going to go? Okay, maybe out to California. It may not have even gone, like, fully south. It may just have been right. the northeast. Right. So during her lifetime, she did really well with sales from this cookbook. She actually did really well. The cookbook sold for $2. Real bargain. And it, it was actually known as the Homemaker's Bible. Or the Bride's Bible. Is that why it looks like a Bible? No, hers, they didn't look like it. Just mine does. <laughs> I don't know why mine does. I got it from... It's so fancy for a cookbook. <laughs> I got I it from... I just can't get over it. <laughs> I got it from Fancy Publishers Incorporated. <laughs> but um, it was known as the Bride... Yeah, the Bride's Bible, the Homemaker's Bible, whatever, because it's full of basic information. It's really interesting if you read it. The very beginning of the cookbook talks about all different kinds of different kinds of fats, different kinds of acids, different kinds of carbohydrates. It talks about a lot of scientific things. There's a big section, which this, this just cracked me up, how to build a fire. 
because stoves were wood fired or coal fired. How to build a fire, how to maintain a fire, what kind of coal to use, what kind of wood to use. It this seems... lady went from the core of everything. You know what it is? It's a textbook. It's not a cookbook. It is a yes. textbook for cooking. Yes, it's a textbook for cooking. So in this, what you'll find, we're, I'm going to give you an example of, a, of an original recipe and then how the recipe was updated because, as I said, the cookbook was continually modernized. And then okay? as ingredients change, because flour we use in 2020 is not going to be the same sort of flour that was used in 1900. Right, right. The recipe that I looked, what I did was I, as I was doing, as I was in this rabbit hole hopping around, I thought, I wonder what the most popular recipe is from the Fannie Farmer cookbook. Like, what's the classic? And the classic recipe that everybody, that is the most popular recipe is Fannie Farmer's classic baked macaroni and cheese. Now, a funny thing in this cookbook that I found in the original, she does have some uh, recipes with European flair, you know. So she has a recipe for Turkish pilaf, which would have been a really kind of a unique and cool thing, you know, how to make pilaf. She has a couple recipes in here that have the prefix southern on them, you know, because I'm sure... Because that would have been exotic in New England. Well, yes, right. And southern style chicken and that sort of thing. So her macaroni and cheese is probably more like... And I, I, I would probably say this is like a the way... This is probably why macaroni and cheese is made this way in the North. Uh, but it kind of did make me laugh because I know I know if you go in different parts of the country, macaroni and cheese is made differently. In yeah, the, we have a macaroni and cheese episode we did comparing yeah. three different types, and they were all very different. Yeah, they're all very different. So this, this uh, the original recipe was retained basically in the new recipe, but the new recipe is probably what you would find in your standard Betty Crocker cookbook or Better Homes and Garden cookbook, that sort of a thing. So in her original recipe, she has she take what she does is she'll take something and start off with a basic thing. And then she these recipes aren't written like a like a normal um, like a recipe card. This is another thing she standardized with recipes. She put the ingredients on top and the directions on the bottom because in the past, re cookbooks weren't like that. It was just like it was written a like paragraph. a paragraph. Yes, yeah. yes, it was written like a Which paragraph. Which makes it really hard to get all the ingredients out that you need ahead of time because if you miss something, right, like, then you're like, oh, I don't have that. I need to go run to the store and this is half made. Right. So she puts the ingredients at the top. She she has her title, the ingredients, and then the directions. So the first, the first in this, the route, the road to macaroni and cheese, we'll call it. Now, I'm assuming, I think macaroni, when you think macaroni now, you think elbow macaroni, okay? Uh, at that time, spaghetti would have been macaroni. It Wait, wasn't... so this was spaghetti and cheese? Well, macaroni was, you know how we call pasta, it's all different kinds of pasta, okay, Macaroni was sort of like a generic term then, okay? And you have to also remember that these people were not Italians. There's not Ita this is not these people weren't Italian. These people were English of, of English descent, probably that were in New England. So you're not having the um, Italian telling you what kind of posture you're using in a recipe. I, I mean, I don't I've never seen Italian mac and cheese before. No. But, but but what I'm saying yeah. is, you know, just think, for example, German. German, you have uh, German noodles, and mm -hmm. then you have a couple different kinds of German noodles that have different names, but none of them is spaghetti, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is probably, I would say, comparable to spaghetti because she talks about breaking the macaroni up into small pieces. So I'm thinking it was like a long spaghetti noodle, mm -hmm. you know, and you could use it for a lot of different things, Okay. So that would be my guess. That would be my guess because, <laughs> because of the description, because it's not a noodle. This isn't a regular noodle, and this isn't an elbow macaroni. You told me a little bit about this recipe off air, but not that part, and I'm, I'm just still trying to wrap my brain around that. You know the so one I'll thing? Just, it'll just take me a couple minutes while you're going through the recipe. We're going to be like, 
It's spaghetti and cheese. Like the thing that keeps <laughs> popping into my mind is the Yankee Doodle song where it says, "Yeah, stuck a feather in his cap and called it macaroni." Well, you know darn well the feather was a long feather. It wasn't just you know. So it obviously didn't look like an elbow See, macaroni. I always thought macaroni was like an adjective of saying like like that was a slang for meat or whatever. I think it was a slang for cool back then but i think also macaroni was long because a feather is long and like, also dang, cool. that guy looks macaroni yeah, what people a are weird like weird compliment people are like i want to bring that back i'm gonna start calling people macaroni <laughs> and just not explain myself <laughs> that coat is macaroni oh heavens heavens so her first recipe here is for boiled macaroni and you need three-fourths of a cup of macaroni broken in inch pieces, two quarts of boiling water, one tablespoon of salt, and a half cup of cream. So she says cook the macaroni in boiling salted water 20 minutes, whew, or until, that must have been some minutes? macaroni, or 20, until soft. 20 minutes? Hey, this is 1896. We don't know what macaroni was like then. It could have been made from cement. Drain in a strainer, Pour over it cold water to prevent pieces from adhering. Add cream, reheat, and season with salt. So there's your boiled macaroni, and you're serving it with heavy cream over it, right? Now step down macaroni with white sauce. Kind of the same directions. Three-fourths cup of macaroni broken inch pieces, two quarts boiling water, one tablespoon salt, one and a half cups of white sauce, which is your standard white sauce, flour, butter, milk. Okay, so cook as for boiled macaroni and reheat in white sauce. Here's your white sauce recipe. Melt two tablespoons butter, add two tablespoons flour, one half teaspoon of salt, and pour slowly one and a half cups of scalded milk into it. And then, you know. So now right under that is baked macaroni, which is just putting the white sauce on the macaroni and baking it. Okay, and then... Baked macaroni with cheese. So this is the culmination of all the above recipes. So you're going to take your macaroni that you boiled already for 20 minutes and drained and rinsed in cold and water. Bake it some more. And you're going to butter a baking dish. And you're going to take some cheese. It doesn't describe what kind of cheese. But I'm sure this is a whatever kind of cheese you have kind of a thing. Would it be farmer's cheese? It could be. So you're going you're gonna to grate some cheese in the bottom of your dish. Then you're going to put some macaroni on top. And then a little more cheese, a little more macaroni, a little more cheese. And then you're going to take that one and a half cups of white sauce, pour it over the top, cover it with buttered breadcrumbs, and bake until your crumbs are brown. That's her macaroni and cheese recipe. So you don't mix... The macaroni with melted cheese, you just no. layer it in the dish and you, then it like melts yes. together. And I tried this with elbow macaroni. I didn't have any of that fancy Yankee Doodle you macaroni. You didn't try it with spaghetti? Boiling it for 20 minutes? You know, I could have. I just you wonder imagine? what would happen. You, Can you I imagine? I think you need to try that with a couple pieces of spaghetti just to see what would happen if you boil it that they would long. Because so I can't imagine. They would be. It would just be. They would be mush. Completely, like, dissolved in the water. Yeah, they would be mush. Even regular, like, big spaghetti, 10 minutes is, yeah, yeah 10 minutes. So needless to say, some 50 years later, apparently macaroni had changed a bit. Significantly. <laughs> so, um, this is the updated baked mac macaroni and cheese. And this is basically... That original recipe, but updated. So this recipe was in the 1946 edition of the Fanny Farmer Boston Cooking School Cookbook. And a lot of people say this is the best macaroni and cheese they've ever had. This is what you do with this recipe. You need one eight-ounce package of macaroni, four tablespoons of butter, four tablespoons of flour, one cup of milk, one cup of cream, half teaspoon of salt, freshly ground black pepper, two cups of shredded cheddar cheese, and a half cup of breadcrumbs toasted in butter. Okay? So you're going to preheat your oven to 400 degrees. You're going to cook and drain your macaroni 
according to the package directions, which I'm How sure long? do not take. I'm I'm going to say seven minutes because that's typical for elbow macaroni. Seven minutes. <laughs> Hear that? So, drain and cook your macaroni for seven minutes, no matter what your package says. <laughs> And, and then drain that. In a large saucepan, you're going to melt your butter, take your flour, and mix it with the salt and just a, just a shake of pepper. Um, and you're going to use a whisk to stir that into the butter. And then add your milk and cream gradually, stirring constantly to make a nice white sauce. When it gets to the boiling point, you're going to time it and boil for two minutes, and you're going to keep stirring it. Okay? Once you've got it, it'll be, like, nice and thick. You're going to get to that thick part. You're going to reduce the heat and just let it cook for about 10 minutes and keep stirring it. And it'll be nice. You'll see it'll develop a nice consistency. And you're going to add that two cups of shredded cheese while you're stirring. Do they specify a type of cheese in this one? It says cheddar cheese, and it says to use a good quality of cheddar cheese. Because, you know, it's 1946, so I'm sure there could be some really bad cheeses out there right after the war. Mm -hmm. oh. So... You're going to get your stir that while your cheese melts. Once your cheese is melted, take it off the heat, and then you're going to put your macaroni into that and toss it around to coat it really well. Then you're going to transfer your cheesy macaroni into a buttered baking dish, sprinkle it with those breadcrumbs, and bake it for 20 minutes until the top is golden brown. And that is the Fanny Farmer Classic macaroni and cheese. If you noticed, it's almost the same as the other recipe because you're using a white sauce. You're putting cheese in the white sauce though. You're not layering it in with the macaroni because you're incorporating it into the sauce. You're using the toasted buttered breadcrumbs to bake it on top. So it's basically the same sort of recipe. So now how does this compare to what we would typically think of as like a southern mac and cheese that's really cheesy? In a southern mac and cheese, there would also be four eggs in this. <laughs> There'd be more milk and four eggs. Now, they, uh, southern macaroni and cheese usually does not use a white sauce. It does, you don't make a creamy cheese sauce. What you typically do for that is you blend melted butter, milk, and eggs, and you get that all warmed up on the stove, and then you add a whole lot of cheese to that, and then you put your macaroni into it, stir it well, and bake it. So it comes out, um, it's not thickened. Mm -hmm. The eggs do the thickening while it's baking. Yeah, it seems like, I like call this it doesn't a, have quite as much cheese as I would expect. No, but this makes a cheesy sauce. It, yeah. it's, a very, it's a very nice rich sauce on it. Mm -hmm. So that's, and that's usually what I would say is like the northern style of, ma of macaroni and cheese is some people don't bake it even. They put the cheese sauce on it and it's, that's the macaroni and cheese. So, so it's like a macaroni and cheese sauce right, instead of right. mac and cheese. Right, but this is baked, which mm -hmm. is a little different, which I'm sure... At the time, was like, ooh, baked macaroni and cheese. Who ever heard of such a yeah. toasted breadcrumbs? Who heard of such a thing? So that's an updated, you know. But but again, there you are with your standardized recipe, and and you could go within that recipe. You could change the type of cheese you're mm -hmm. using, you know. So it's a good recipe, and it holds up. That's the thing when you think it about needed it. Very little modification. Right. Very slight to modification. It, even after fifty, I mean. Even after 100 years, right. you wouldn't need much modification to still have that recipe be good. Right. And another thing is, Fanny, the Fanny Farmer recipes use very basic ingredients. So it's not usually the average household would have all of those ingredients. Now, if you look at the old cookbook, like I said, there's a ton of seafood in there. So the average New England household would have yeah. all of those things in readily Western available. PA, you may not have all the seafood stuff readily available to you, but you know, like the standard pantry ingredients, there's yes. so much stuff with the regular pantry stuff. Yes, yes. So it's it's uh, it's you know it's very good. Now after she published, after Fanny Farmer published her cookbook, she uh, kind of went on tour with it. She did public cooking. You know how they do those cooking shows now, where you buy an expensive ticket and go to a theater and watch somebody cook on stage. She kind of did that around around the uh, New England area for a while and went out and did live cooking demonstrations. And she actually, um, I, I read an account that 
she didn't like to cook on stage because she got distracted by talking. So she had assistants do the cooking because she kept burning stuff. <laughs> I swear. So. It's like she's almost like 1900s Julia Child. Yes. Because yes. the the whole um, cookbook standardization thing, that's kind of like what Julia Child did when she made these French recipes into like using American measurements so right. that we can make them at home. And because like... American ingredients are different than European ones, modifying it so that the end product is similar to what the end product would be in France using French ingredients. Right, right. And she she did, um, she really did make American cooking, she popularized this style of American cooking where it's uh, basic, simple, basic ingredients to produce a good meal, to produce a good food, you know. So that's, I think that's probably one of her many claim to fames. So she did these, she taught for years. She actually had her own cooking school, the Fanny Farmer Cooking School. She did several cookbooks. She popularized the idea of food science for the homemaker. And I think food science... We probably think that's a modern term or a modern idea. And yeah, I know everybody always thinks of it associated with molecular gastronomy. Right. And I think when you think about this person did this because she was just such a go getter. Mm -hmm. And she did this even after being an invalid for so long and having some health issues. She did this. And it's just so interesting to think about that somebody in that time period in the late 1800s developed the idea of food science. She may have done that because right. she had been an invalid for so long and couldn't get up and do stuff yes. for a period of time. So that was present in her mind, whereas somebody who didn't go through that may not have even considered that being a possibility. Right, right. So I think, I, I just thought it was amazing. I was thinking, you know, it's all this um, with the uh, 100th anniversary of women's suffrage and talking about all the things that women have done that have just been bypassed. This is a pretty big one because this is something that has benefited yeah. everyone. I have never even heard about her before today. I, you know, I've had this cookbook and I knew about Fanny Farmer and I knew that it was an old cookbook. You know, I kind of knew that. I knew that she was like a pioneer in cookery, but I didn't know the extent of it. And if you, I, I seriously recommend that you get this cookbook just because you get the 18, the original Fanny Farmer cookbook from 1896, because when you read the beginnings of it, the chapters that she has on nutrition for 1896 to think that someone was that insightful to have developed these ideas when like people had just learned about washing their hands to, for for health, for hygiene, you know, or putting screens in the window wasn't even a popular yeah. idea when yet. When you put it in context of the time period, yes, it's mind blowing. It is. It is absolutely mind blowing. And when you read the cookbook and you, and you hear some of the things she said, this is a quote from her: "Correct measurements are absolutely necessary to ensure the best results." Good judgment with experience has taught some to measure by sight, but the majority need definite guides. And that is from Fanny Farmer. True words were never spoken, having seen many episodes of the show Nailed It. <laughs> People need to use measuring cups when they're following a recipe. That's, I mean, that's literally where everyone goes wrong. Right. Is right. by not using... I know this from experience. Things. I know this. The person who cannot make jello knows this from experience. So this is, I, I hope, I really hope, uh, first of all, that you yourself go and dig a little bit about Fanny Farmer because she's a really interesting person. And uh, I hope that you enjoyed this podcast and you didn't find it too horribly boring if you listened the whole way through. And if you didn't, you won't even hear this part. You'll just be eating that chocolate cake. We should have said at the beginning of the show, Make the cake and then eat the cake while you're listening. So hey, you'll be all idea. sugared up and you won't fall asleep. That's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I hope you like this episode about Fanny Farmer and her cookery book. And I hope you try that cake because I'm telling you, you got to try it's that cake. so good. You got to try that cake. Oh, but before you make the cake, make sure you have vanilla ice cream in your freezer. That is my pro tip. Because if you don't have vanilla ice cream in your freezer, oh. Kel disappoint. 
<laughs> Be sure to check us out online at MerrimacPodcast.com, on Facebook and Instagram at Merrimack Bakehouse, and on Twitter at Mobile Mary Mac and Merrimack Podcast. Thanks a lot for listening if you did, and if you didn't, too bad for you.